d. The original condition of man as the image of God. There is a very close connection between the image of God and the original state of man, and therefore the two are generally considered together. Once again we shall have to distinguish between different historical views as to the original condition of man. 1. The Protestant view. Protestants teach that man was created in a state of relative perfection, a state of righteousness and holiness. This does not mean that he had already reached the highest state of excellence of which he was susceptible. It is generally assumed that he was destined to reach a higher degree of perfection in the way of obedience. He was, something like a child, perfect in parts, but not yet in degree. His condition was a preliminary and temporary one, which would either lead on to greater perfection and glory or terminate in a fall. He was by nature endowed with that original righteousness which is the crowning glory of the image of God, and consequently lived in a state of positive holiness. The loss of that righteousness meant the loss of something that belonged to the very nature of man in its ideal state. Man could lose it and still remain man, but he could not lose it and remain man in the ideal sense of the word. In other words, its loss would really mean a deterioration and impairment of human nature. Moreover, man was created immortal. This applies not only to the soul, but to the whole person of man, and therefore does not merely mean that the soul was destined to have a continued existence. Neither does it mean that man was raised above the possibility of becoming a prey to death, this can only be affirmed of the angels and the saints in heaven. It does mean, however, that man, as he was created by God, did not bear within him the seeds of death and would not have died necessarily in virtue of the original constitution of his nature. Though the possibility of his becoming a victim of death was not excluded, he was not liable to death as long as he did not sin. It should be borne in mind that man's original immortality was not something purely negative and physical, but was something positive and spiritual as well. It meant life in communion with God and the enjoyment of the favor of the Most High. This is the fundamental conception of life in Scripture, just as death is primarily separation from God and subjection to His wrath. The loss of this spiritual life would spell death, and would also result in physical death, compared to especially, Kennedy, St. Paul's conceptions of the last things, chapter 3. 2. The Roman Catholic View. Roman Catholics naturally have a somewhat different view of the original condition of man. According to them original righteousness did not belong to the nature of man in its integrity, but was something supernaturally added. In virtue of his creation man was simply endowed with all the natural powers and faculties of human nature as such, and by the justicia naturalis these powers were nicely adjusted to each other. He was without sin and lived in a state of perfect innocency. In the very nature of things, however, there was a natural tendency of the lower appetites and passions to rebel against the higher powers of reason and conscience. This tendency, called concupiscence, was not itself sin, but could easily become the occasion and fuel for sin. But compared to Romans 7 verse 8, Colossians 3 verse 5, Ithes, for colon 5, or thver. Man, then, as he was originally constituted, was by nature without positive holiness, but also without sin, though burdened with a tendency which might easily result in sin. But now, God added to the natural constitution of man the supernatural gift of original righteousness, by which he was enabled to keep the lower propensities and desires in due subjection. When man fell, he lost that original righteousness, but the original constitution of human nature remained intact. The natural man is now exactly where Adam was before he was endowed with original righteousness, though with a somewhat stronger bias towards evil. 3. Rationalizing views. Pelagians, Socinians, Arminians, Rationalists, and Evolutionists, all discount the idea of a primitive state. Of holiness altogether. The first four are agreed that man was created in a state of innocence, of moral and religious neutrality, but was endowed with a free will, so that he could turn in either direction. Evolutionists assert that man began his career in a state of barbarism, in which he was but slightly removed from the brute. Rationalists of all kinds believe that a concreated righteousness and holiness is a contradiction in terms. Man determines his character by his own free choice, and holiness can only result from a victorious struggle against evil. From the nature of the case, therefore, Adam could not have been created in a state of holiness. Moreover, Pelagians, Socinians, and rationalists hold that man was created mortal. 
Death did not result from the entrance of sin into the world, but was simply the natural termination of human nature as it was constituted. Adam would have died in virtue of the original constitution of his nature. Questions for further study, what is the precise distinction which D. Lich makes between the soul and the spirit in man? How does Herd make use of the tripartite conception of man in the interpretation of original sin, conversion, and sanctification? What accounts for the fact that Lutherans are prevailingly traditionists, and Reformed prevailingly creationists? How about the objection that creationism virtually destroys the unity of the human race? What objections are there against realism with its assumption of the numerical unity of human nature? What criticism would you offer on Dorner's view, that the theories of pre-existentialism, traditionism, and creationism, are simply three different aspects of the whole truth respecting the origin of the soul? How do Roman Catholics generally distinguish between the image and the likeness of God? Do they believe that man lost his justicia or natural righteousness by the fall or not? How do those Lutherans who restrict the image of God to man's original righteousness explain Genesis 9 verse 6 and James 3 verse 9? Literature. Bavink, Jeref. Dogm. 2, pp 566-635, Kuiper, Dict. Dogm, De Creaturis C, pp 3-131, Vos, Jeref. Dogm. 2, pp 1-21, Hodge, Syst, Theol, 2, pp 42-116, Dabney, Syst, and Polem. Theol, pp. 292 to 302, Shed, Dogm. Theol, 2, pp 4 to 114, Lytton, Introd. To Dogm. Theol, pp 107 to 122, Dorna, Syst, of CHR Doct. 2, pp 68 to 96, Schmidt, Doct. Theol of the EV. Luth. Church, pp 225 to 238, Martinson, CHR. Dogm, pp 136 to 148, Piper, CHR Dogm. I, pp 617 to 630, Valentine, CHR. Theol. I, pp 383 to 415, Pope, CHR Theol. I, pp 421 to 436, Raymond, SYST. Theol, 2, pp 7-49, Wilmers, Handbook of the CHR Relative to, pp 219-233, or, God's Image in Man, pp 3-193, A, Kuiper, Jr., H.E.T. Beald Gods, pp 8-143, Tama, De Anthropologie van Calvigen, pp 29-68, Heard, The Tripartita Nature of Man, Dixon, St. Paul's Use of the Terms Flesh and Spirit, Chaps. VXI, D. Lich, SYST, of Bibble Psych, pp 103-144, Laidlaw, The Bibble Doct. Of Man, pp 49-108, H. W. Robinson, The CHR. Doct. Of Man, pp 4-150.